Alma was arrested for prostitution. She didn't cause many problems for the juvenile detention facility other than gathering sharp objects like paper clips, pencils, staples, or pull tops from pop cans to cut herself. When the staff would find her stash of sharp objects, she would just bite herself instead. Alma was raised by a teen mom with her little sister. She grew up in a tiny apartment that she referred to as disgusting, and she said she was always hungry. Sometimes she and her sister would subsist on ketchup packets and random french fries that they would find on the floor. Alma's mom was a meth addict and various men would drop by the apartment. Alma quickly learned that if she sat on the laps of some of these men, they would share their fast food with her. Although she tucked the girls in at night, Alma's mom sometimes would leave the apartment and left the girls sleeping alone. When Alma would wake up in the middle of the night, she would be terrified in the apartment, but would pretend like she was brave for her little sister. As she got older, her mom forced her to spend private time with some of the men who would come by. And that was when Alma started to run away. Eventually, she and her sister were removed from the home by Child Protective Services and placed in two different foster families. Alma was angry, distrustful, she hoarded food, and she broke things. She missed her sister desperately and got moved into three different foster families. Alma developed panic attacks, and when she felt like her heart would literally break through her chest, she would take a razor blade and cut on her thighs or the side of her breast. Alma believed she was bad, disgusting, and worthless. So when she met a 24-year-old boy who thought she was smart and beautiful, she quickly fell in love. He took her out to eat, he bought her jewelry, he bought her clothes. Alma thought she was going to marry him. Instead, he got her into drugs and forced her to have sex with six men a night. If she questioned him or tried to leave, he would beat her. Trauma among incarcerated youth is the rule, not the exception. One study found 93% of youth in custody had experienced one traumatic incident. Over half had experienced six or more. Many of these traumas occurred during childhood. Children don't know how to process scary, disturbing, or painful events. And the same people who often caused them the most harm were the very same people who were, children were completely dependent on for love, stability, and protection. And those adults and the other adults that could have helped them survive and get through and deal with these painful events were often struggling with their very own issues. Hurt people hurt people. Interpersonal traumas tend to have the most negative impact on young people. Things like abuse, neglect, domestic violence, and separation from one's parents. Depression, anxiety, PTSD, attention problems, substance abuse issues, aggressive, violent, delinquent behavior, these are all associated with experiencing trauma. And childhood neglect, is just as harmful as physical or sexual abuse. Many youth in custody have been victimized multiple times in multiple ways by multiple individuals. More trauma to an individual means more damage to a child or adolescent. In fact, when you look at kids who have had one traumatic incident and you compare them to those who have had multiple traumas like those in custody, those who've experienced multiple traumas have double the risk of depression. They have three, they're three times more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. They're three to five times more likely to develop alcohol or substance abuse with other kinds of drugs. They're also at high risk of delinquency, school struggles, running away, and suicide. These are the youth that are in our juvenile justice facilities. So let's talk about the brain. When we're faced with a threatening situation, our body automatically goes into fight or flight survival mode, and we release certain chemicals in our brain. For the youth that we work with who are repeatedly traumatized, who live in these chronic stressful environments, those chemicals are continually activated in their brain. And that can actually change the structure or function of youth's brains. So the traumatized youth we work with are literally biologically wired for survival. They're always revved up, they're always tense, they're always reactive. 
They're constantly scanning the environment, trying to look for signs of possible threat, and then they impulsively respond. Not surprisingly, the youth we work with see threats, see danger, see attacks, even when there's none there. So a basic request from staff is often perceived as a challenge. In casual conversation, they hear disrespect when none was intended. Traumatized youth are very sensitive to nonverbals. So our inflection, our tone of voice, our body posture, how close we're standing to youth. Their automatic reactions are even intensified more when they're not feeling safe in a facility. Now, despite the high rates of trauma among these youth, most youth in custody are not diagnosed with a trauma-related condition and they do not receive trauma-related treatment. This is because, number one, most screening and assessment doesn't include a trauma-specific tool. Two, most boys involved with juvenile justice notoriously underreport physical abuse and sexual abuse, as well as if they've been negatively impacted by it. And then very importantly, trauma is often misdiagnosed as another mental health disorder. So if these kids are revved up, preoccupied, constantly scanning the environment, they're not paying attention to what they should be. They're forgetful, they're distracted, they're restless. They get misdiagnosed with ADHD and put on stimulant medication. Or for a lot of these youth, they might have unpredictable moods. They have these angry outbursts that are out of out of proportion to what provoked them. And once they're upset, they have a hard time calming down. They often get diagnosed with bipolar disorder and put on heavy duty mood stabilizing medication. And then, not surprisingly, youth with multiple traumas use a lot of alcohol and drugs to deal with what they witnessed or what happened to them. So they may be diagnosed and treated solely for a substance use disorder. And then what we see a lot in custody is kids who have been repeatedly victimized, who may run away from home, skip school, they may break laws, they show no remorse for their actions, they have no emotion, no empathy, and they really care about themselves. They often get diagnosed <clears throat> with conduct disorder or antisocial personality traits. If you think about it, traumatized youth are often guarded, closed off, they're trying to protect themselves from additional harm. Anger and aggression has worked for them, that has helped them survive. So why would they give that up, particularly if they're not feeling safe in a facility? Plus, if the adults who are supposed to teach them empathy, compassion, and love were the exact people who were exploiting them, hurting them, and abandoning them, they may never have learned how to care about other people. You would think youth in custody who have experienced victimization would be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. They've had exploitation, they've had betrayal, they've been victimized multiple times, but most are not diagnosed with PTSD. The PTSD diagnosis, post-traumatic stress disorder, it fits well with a one-time event, witnessing a murder, being in a car accident, being raped, but it often doesn't capture the chronic, repeated, interpersonal types of trauma that our youth experience. The term complex trauma is much more accurate. Sadly, this diagnosis was not included in the most recent manual of mental disorders. Clinicians often forget that incarcerated boys tend to show their grief, their anxiety, and their depression through anger, aggression, and violence. So they're typically seen as bad kids versus traumatized and sad kids. Some youth in custody have been given three, four, five or more mental health or substance use diagnoses because they do exhibit so many problems in so many areas. But most clinicians don't consider that some or possibly all of these symptoms may be stemming from an underlying core of trauma.